Colossians chapter 3. We read those scriptures from Mark's gospel chapter 7 where Jesus was talking about what it is that makes a person unclean. And it was there that he said, it's not what goes into the man that defiles him, uh, but what comes out of the man. And I've heard that verse used to justify alcoholism and all kinds of other things. I assure you that's not what it's intended for. So, in essence, what I believe part of the context is here is no matter what a person eats in this regard, that's not so much of importance as it is the words that come out of the mouth because they originate from the heart. So the Apostle Paul, he saw the importance of this as well as he moves now in Colossians chapter 3 to a list of sins that pertain to what comes out of the mouth. Uh, Cruel, filthy, ungodly, God-dishonoring words, they have consequences. And after they come out of the mouth, you can try all you like to say, I take it back, I take it back, but you can't really take it back. Those words cannot be unsaid, and the person that you said them to will never be able to unhear them. You might try to lessen the effect of the blow by saying something like, well, you know, I didn't really mean it, but your words have already revealed your heart and your true feelings about the person you said those words to, or the person you were talking about. So this list that Paul is about to give is a very serious list, and we need to take it seriously because it has a direct relation to whether or not we are living worthy of Jesus Christ and whether or not we are living worthy of the new creature that he has created us to be. So we're going to see some things tonight that we are to put off And then we'll see some things that we are to put on. So Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 8 through 15. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. May God bless the reading of his word and the hearing of it to our hearts. Back in verse number 8, notice it says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. These are more things that we need to to mortify. We spoke last Wednesday night from previous verses about things that need to be put to death in the life of a child of God because they have no place in the life of a Christian. And these are more of those things, things that also need to be mortified. And the Colossian believers were commanded to mortify these things because of their new lives in Christ. And it's the same for you and I here in 2024. We are to put to death the deeds and the desires of the old man, that earthly, sinful nature. Everything that was listed above back in verse number 5 and everything that's listed here in verse number 8 has got to go. It's got to go. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, we are to disrobe these things. We are to take them off like filthy, worn-out garments. When you get all cleaned up for an occasion, 
You don't step out of the shower and put the same old nasty, filthy, smelly clothes on that you just took off before you put on the clean clothes that you're going to wear out for the occasion. No, you'll need to put on some nice, clean clothes that are decent and presentable and leave that old filthy clothing behind. Leave that off. You've disrobed that. Don't put that back on. It's the same way with coming to Christ in salvation. We can't put on Christ without disrobing the things that represent that old life of sin. We talked a lot about sexual immorality here last week because that's where the text of Scripture led us. And now we're talking about things that spill over into evil speech. Evil speech. And the first thing that's mentioned here is anger. Anger. This is the Greek word orge. It has the connotation of a violent passion. A violent passion. Maybe you know people who live this way. Maybe you've known people who are angry. The life, uh, life application commentary defines this anger as a continuous attitude of hatred that remains bottled up on the inside. Anger is something that typically, typically lies underneath the surface. Wherever there's anger, there is potential for the unity between believers to be disrupted. There's the potential, wherever there's anger, there's potential for division to come in, to disrupt the harmony of, of a church, of individuals, of a family, whatever the case may be. It's hard to get along with other people when you're always angry. Amen. Amen. It's hard to get along with other people who are always angry. So do you see the potential is there for harmony to be disrupted, and for unity to be disrupted. Anger disrupts unity. So we are to put that off. The next one is wrath. And this is speaking of an angry outburst. An angry outburst. Where anger lies under the surface, wrath comes exploding outward. So wrath is often having a quick temper for selfish reasons. And it could be anything. Maybe someone hurt your pride. Maybe someone bruised your ego and you didn't like that and you think they showed you up in front of other people so now you have a quick-tempered outburst to try to get even. The person who shows this wrath is, off, is often characterized by the wrath that they show and they have difficulty controlling it. They need Christ. They need Christ. When Christ controls your life instead of you controlling your life, wrath will be put to death and then you won't be walking around in it and living in this kind of condition. And then we have malice. Malice. Someone who engages in malice will do evil to those who have done good to them. That's a part of what it, what it means to have malice in your life. You do evil to people who have done good to you. Malice destroys relationships. Malice is a deliberate, purposeful attempt to harm or to do evil to another person. That's malice. There's no accident where malice is concerned. Malice is intentional. Malice is done on purpose. And then there's blasphemy. And in this context that we're dealing with tonight, we're talking about injurious speaking. Now when we think of blasphemy, often the first thing that comes to mind is speaking against God. And that certainly is blasphemy. That is blasphemy. But here we're talking about people. It's slander. It's slander. The ESV and the NASB, which are both good translations, by the way, trans tr translate the Greek word blasphemia as slander in those verses. This is tearing down somebody else's reputation. Tearing down somebody else's reputation by telling lies, by gossiping, and by spreading rumors. This isn't about exposing false teachers. False teachers need to be exposed. And we are to do so, and we can do so, because when a false teacher is exposed, it's done in truth. So that's not the same thing as just outright gossiping about someone or outright lying about another individual. And this blasphemy is defaming someone's character. Again, it destroys relationships. It disrupts unity. It disrupts the harmony 
within a body of people. We, we shouldn't, uh, well, we wouldn't be able to come in here into this place of worship and be united in our worship to God if all we ever did was slander each other. We wouldn't be able to come into this sanctuary and worship God in unity and in harmony if all we ever did uh, was uh, tear each other down, gossip about one another, talk about one another, work to damage and undermine people's relationships. And the Colossians couldn't do that either. And then there's filthy communication out of, the, out of your mouth. This is crude talk. Crude talk. This is language that is unnecessarily abrasive, such as that used by a local pastor when he wants to insult a particular group of people. He needs to repent of that, by the way, if he hasn't done that yet. I've not seen any indication, any indication that he has. But this goes for just anybody who, who uses filthy, crude language. That's what we're talking about here. Paul is telling the Colossians so they can put a stop to filthy communication before it comes out of their mouths. And all of these vices are things that have no place in the heart and life of a child of God. All of these are things that have no place in the life of a person whose heart is inhabited by the Lord Jesus Christ. These vices are contrary to Christ. These are things of the old life. These things represent the old sinful man or the sinful woman before we came to know the Lord Jesus. When we put him, uh, when we know him, we are to put off these things and live in a manner that is befitting our king. And that includes the sexual immorality that we talked about last week. And it includes these sins of speech that we see here in verse number 8. We shouldn't focus on one list and ignore the other. Believers are called to put to death all of these things that we've mentioned already in, verse, uh, or in chapter 3 of Colossians. Let's look at verses 9 and 10 here. It says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So Paul concluded this dreadful vice list with a plea for truth. All of this is about becoming more like Jesus Christ, who is the truth. That's what our Lord said, John 14 and 6, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the old saying goes, the proof is in the pudding. Well, the evidence of conversion for the Christian is found in the way that we interact with other people. Lying disrupts unity. It destroys relationships. It causes problems within churches. We need to be people of the truth. God help us to be people of the truth here in this place. Interaction with other people is very, very important. It's far more important than we often think to realize. That's why the Lord put all of this in the Bible, so that we could learn these important lessons. We'll never be able to grow if we live our lives in isolation with no other believers around. And since we need other believers to fellowship with uh, and to encourage us and to hold us accountable, it is of the utmost importance how we interact with other believers. This is very important. We need to interact. First of all, we need believers in our lives to interact with. Amen. Amen. And then we need to interact with them in a way that will promote unity and promote harmony. Amen. Not to tear down, not to destroy, not to disrupt unity and harmony, but to promote those things. The church is not a social club. The church is not a fraternity it's not supposed to be a group of people who are just like we are. The church consists of people who have various different backgrounds. And I'm thankful for that. But the church is there for people who are different to come together in one body, the body of Christ. And we, could, uh, we see this in verse number 11. Look at verse number 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, 
but Christ is all and in all. Amen. Now for the new man, there's no racial distinctions, there's no cultural distinctions, there's no educational or social distinctions that separate us. We now abide in Christ. If you're saved by the grace of God, you abide in Christ. I abide in Christ. I profess to be saved. Christ saved me. We're not the same. We don't have to be the same. We have different backgrounds, but we're one in Him because He brings us together with Him. We are in union with Him, and therefore we are in union with one another. We are all one in Christ. Christ is everything. Let me say that again. Christ is everything. S. Lewis Johnson pointed out three realms in which Christ is everything. First of all, he's everything in salvation. The angels have no part in this work of redemption. It's all of Christ. He's everything in sanctification. So legalism has no place in the life of a believer. And he's everything necessary for human satisfaction. I could testify to that tonight. Therefore, there is no need for the deeds of the old man Christ satisfies completely. I didn't tell Melissa that I would be saying this tonight, so when we sang I'll be satisfied, see how fitting that is with the service tonight? Because Christ is the only thing that's going to satisfy. He satisfies completely. He is everything to the child of God. He is everything to the believer. He's everything to that one who has been born again. And to try to be satisfied some other way would be only to serve to be a hindrance. Either to yourself or to someone else. So at the time of this writing, Greek culture was spreading around the world. And the Greeks felt a sense of pride as a result. They looked, they looked down on the Jews. They saw the Jews as a people who were stuck in an old way of life. And in turn, the, the Jews looked down on the Greeks because they saw the Greeks as just a bunch of heathens who were outside of a covenant relationship with God. So both the Jews and the Greeks were looking down on each other. There were also religious distinctions that separated people such as circumcision. Some tried to make circumcision necessary for salvation, and some of the Jews saw it as a mockery if the Gentiles were circumcised, and it was all just a great big mess. But all of these distinctions are no more for people who are saved and in the family of God. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. We're all one in Christ. Isn't that good news tonight? The cultural distinctions are also eradicated. As far as your position in Christ is concerned, I'm going to make sure to clarify that. People who were unfamiliar with the Greek language and the Greek culture, they were called barbarians. And it was a name of contempt. If you were called a barbarian, uh, chances are the Greeks didn't like you very much. And then we have the Scythians who were a wild and a primitive tribal people who were considered by some to be no better than the animals. Some people believed that the only thing Scythians were good for was slavery. But praise God, aren't you glad that in Jesus Christ all of these distinctions are gone? Amen. Every person who is in Christ is united to Him and we are all one in Him. And these barriers have been removed because Christ is all and in all. There's no division where Christ dwells. Amen? No division where Christ dwells. He's made every believer a new creature, and those human distinctions we try to place upon each other, He's taken those away. The Lord breaks down every barrier, and He accepts those who come to Him in faith and repentance regardless of who they are. It doesn't matter who you are tonight, my dear friend. If you come to Christ in faith and repentance, He'll receive you into His family. And this is a part of what it means to put on the new man. It means your behavior and your conduct match your profession. You've put on the new man. It's just like putting on new clothes. You've got to take off those evil practices. You've got to take off that 
sexual immorality. You've got to take off that, that wicked speech. It takes nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ and the grace of God to save you, to forgive you, to pardon you, and to pay for your sin. But God commands us to mortify these things and to put them off, and God commands us to put on the new man. Why? Because that's the only way we will ever be able to commit ourselves to the Word of God. That's the only way we will ever be able to commit ourselves to the teachings of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse number 12. It says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. This is about God's chosen people. The elect of God was a term that had been used for Israel. Israel was also holy and beloved. But here in verse number 12, Paul takes all of that and applies it to the Colossians. Not only is this applied to the Colossians, but it also stands for every person who has been redeemed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. So now, Paul lists some qualities that every Christian should possess. The KJV uses the term, bowels of mercies. That's having a tender, compassionate heart. That's what we're talking about, a tender, compassionate heart. Thank God for people who have a tender, compassionate heart. We need more uh, tender, compassionate hearts in this world today. We need people who actively endeavor to show a tender, compassionate heart. In Paul's day, when... People were sick or maimed or elderly or mentally ill even, or even poor. They were considered by many in society just to be a nuisance. Just to be a nuisance. You know, that really hasn't changed very much in the last 2,000 years. I think we could all agree that many people today still see this the same way because they don't know Christ and they don't have tender, compassionate hearts. And the only acts of compassion that we've seen in this world toward the sick and the weak and the disadvantaged, and even toward animals, we'll throw animals in there, all of that has been inspired by Christianity and carried forth by followers of Jesus Christ. So we are to put on bowels of mercies. We are to put on those tender, compassionate hearts. Put that on, Paul says here. We are to put on kindness. True kindness doesn't happen naturally for you. What happens naturally is selfishness. But with Christ we are to be kind. And we can be kind when we know Him because kindness is listed in Galatians chapter 5 as a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness means that we are to act charitably charitably toward others because God has done so to us. God's kindness is on display throughout the Scriptures. Kindness doesn't wait around for people who are in need. Kindness takes the initiative. Kindness acts wisely and not rashly, but kindness is active. Thank God for people who are active in their kindness. God help us to be that kind of people. And then we have humbleness of mind. Christ humbled himself, so we are to humble ourselves. This is an attitude that is not puffed up with pride. Humbleness of mind. Then there's meekness. This is just being gentle and considerate of other people and submissive to the Word of God. Meekness does not mean weakness. Amen? Meekness is not weakness. Again, just as it is is with humility, Christ is our example of meekness. Then we have long-suffering. This is patience. The person who is long-suffering might very well have the right to retaliate against someone else. But instead, they choose to be patient with them. This is nothing less than a work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I can't do this in and of myself, and neither can anyone else. But with the Holy Spirit, we can be a people who are long-suffering. You know, we live in a microwave world today. We live in a society with a drive-through mindset, and we find it hard to be patient about much of anything. God is not on our time schedule, and we struggle with that. But we need to learn to wait on Him. 
I read about a man, a missionary named William Carey, and he did a lot of mission work in India, and he had to wait patiently for his first Hindu convert. He didn't wait patiently for a day or two. He didn't wait patiently for a week or two, not even a year or two. But he waited patiently for seven years. But the Lord gave him grace to do that. And William Carey was blessed to see the fruit of his labor. And we should try to remember that the next time we're sitting at a red light, getting aggravated, waiting on it to turn green. Amen. Verse number 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. All of the things that are mentioned in verse number 12 can only be worked out in our relationships with other people. And the testing ground for this is quarrels. Quarrels or grievances that arise between people. That's when we are really to bear with one another and to forgive one another. You know, in my many years as a Christian, I'm sad to say that it's mostly been the opposite. When people have quarrels with each other or grievances arise between people, it seems like they'll intentionally try to hinder or discourage that person. They'll cause problems. They'll drop you out of their lives or any number of other responses that we might think of tonight. And so many people seem to be stuck in the mindset of long ago. You know, when people long ago had a quarrel with someone, they'd just challenge them to a duel. But we don't do that anymore. That went out of style. So now we just take each other to court or dump each other, walk out of each other's lives, and things like that. But the response that seems to be the rarest of all is the one that Paul calls for, and it's the one that Jesus himself called for, and that is to forbear one another and to forgive one another, just like the Bible says. If you're going to forbear someone, that means you're going to need to show a little bit extra grace to them. You won't be able to do this if you don't know Jesus. Amen. And you won't be able to do this without some long-suffering. <laughs> to forgive someone is not just a one-time deal. This is a mutual, continual forgiveness of any little problem or any little irritation that comes up. And church is the ideal place to live this out as we realize that the people we are forbearing and forgiving or are likely forbearing and forgiving us as well. And we forget that part. Folks don't often consider themselves to be people who need to be forgiven. They don't, they don't often consider themselves to be people who need to be forbeared. But we most assuredly are. And God put this in the Bible for many reasons. There's no way that I could know His every purpose behind it. But it's not hard to see that the church has enough problems with the outside world. Amen? We've got enough problems with the outside world. We don't need a bunch of bickering and infighting going on within the church. Yes, Nobody has time for that. Amen. So we need to forbear one another in love. Right? And we need to forgive one another in love. And the best way to do that is by remembering God's long-suffering and remembering how it is that God has forgiven you and been long-suffering to you. Verse number 14, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The Greek word for charity here is agape. This is talking about love. We need to cultivate a spirit of love. That's a characteristic of all of God's children. Anything else we do or say apart from love is just a sound in brass. It's just a tinkling symbol, but to grow in love is to grow in grace. This verse is showing us a living Christianity, and it shows us how to walk as Jesus Christ himself walked. And by this shall all men know that we are his disciples. Just as that belt of truth in Ephesians chapter 6 comes around the loins and encloses in that whole armor of God and, and binds all of that armor together, love binds all of these other graces together. It's the bond of perfectness. So without love to bind these other graces together, they're going to be displaced and they're going to be scattered all over. They're going to be blown to the wind. This is one reason why this is also vitally important. Let me give you verse number 15. 
And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. When we've mortified all of that sexual immorality, when we've mortified all of that evil speech, when we've put off the things of the old man and we've put on the graces of Colossians chapter 3, and we have, have it all bound together by love, then we'll be able to live in peace with other people. In particular, other believers within the body of Christ. This doesn't mean that every problem is automatically going to be solved. It doesn't mean that every difference that you're ever going to have with another person is just going to go away. But it does mean that there is a way that we could serve together and worship together and exist together in spite of our differences. We don't achieve this state of peace by our own effort. It takes God to enable us. It takes God to strengthen us. We need Him. We can't do it on our own. We need God to do this. And when peace rules, then peace can settle any strife or any friction so that believers can continue to walk together in unity and in harmony. Peace must rule in our hearts. When peace rules in the lives of individual Christians, then it only stands to reason that peace will rule within the life of the church. And finally, we're told to be thankful. This is no small virtue here. This is a great big thing, to be thankful. Charles Spurgeon said that the absence of thank thankfulness leaves ungratefulness to God. I'm going to paraphrase something else that Spurgeon said about verse number 15 here. I'm going to take his words and I'm going to paraphrase that and put it in my own hillbilly vernacular tonight. But this is what Spurgeon said about verse number 15. He said, when you sit down to eat a meal and you start complaining about your food, he said, what you need to do at that point is get you a couple slices of bread and butter it up real good and put some thankfulness on it and eat you a big old Colossians 3.15 sandwich and be thankful. Amen. Amen. That's all right, isn't it? He said, eat that and be thankful. A thankful heart comes from two things. Asking and trusting God for strength to bear the trials of life and deliberately choosing to give thanks. And when we do this, God will fill your heart with strength and gratitude. We truly do have so much to be thankful for. No matter how bad we think we have it, we can always find something to rejoice in if we'll just open our eyes and look for it. Let's all pray together tonight.